So good afternoon everyone, my name is Tiana Sakaraya. Um, I'm an undergrad student at the ANU in Canberra. And first of all, I just want to thank um, the Centre for counter Hegemonic Studies, as well as Hands of Syria, um, for in and particularly uh, Professor Tim Anderson for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I'm very honoured and can only hope to provide some useful insight and perspective about the repetitive struggle against false narratives and disinformation we are faced with, um, yet in which we must partake. Today I'll particularly be focusing on the media campaign surrounding the current situation in Syria, obviously a very prominent topic in recent headlines and one very close to my heart considering I have family over there facing the immediate reality of the war and of the economic sanctions imposed on Syria by US and Western states every day. The eruption of the Syrian conflict in 2011 paved the way for not only the most documented and photographed war in human history, but also the collapse of the integrity of Western media outlets and corporate institutions whose injection of poisonous agendas into their coverage of the conflict have escalated the devastating war. Up until the past couple of years, these powerful institutions have facilitated blind acceptance of Western interventionism in the Middle East by means of proxy Islamist death squads. Recently, however, we've seen the threat of direct military aggression on Syria from Western powers manifest itself as a very real and frightening reality. In order to understand how we can tackle the information campaign against Syria, we must first theorise about how this issue plays out um, in the media we consume. So last year, um, I had the honour of presenting here at UCID, um, and during that talk I presented a concept which I believe can help us in understanding how Western and corporate media propagate imperialist hegemonic agendas under a pretense of humanitarian, humanitarianism in Syria. I'd like to reintroduce this term today, mainly because I think it has a role in helping us understand the controversy surrounding Syria. So this concept is the Syrian MacGuffin, and no, I found, unfortunately, it doesn't start sounding any less ridiculous the more you say it. Um, the whole idea of the MacGuffin plays on viewing the Syrian conflict as an elaborate show or production, aimed at furthering an agenda with little to no resistance from mass consumers. A MacGuffin, a term coined by Alfred Hitchcock in 1939, um, in fiction, is a plot device in the form of some goal, desired object, or abstract ideal that the protagonist, or in this case, the moral proposition of public opinion, as facilitated by popular media, pursues. In simple words, it's the trigger for the plot. By the end of a narrative, the MacGuffin becomes typically unimportant to the overall plot and loses its significance as the events of the story unfold. Putting aside the raging, ranging political perspectives surrounding this war, Let's just focus for now on framing the Syrian conflict as a basic narrative. By doing this, it becomes clear how Western media utilises through sentimentalised journalism the quest for freedom, peace and human rights as a means to justify its prolonging of the bloodshed in Syria for its regime change agenda. So much so that the concept of humanitarianism is now nothing but a MacGuffin, an evocative sounding but ultimately disposable plot device for Western imperialism and its long-term plan for regional transformation. Okay, so we have the MacGuffinization of justice for Syria as a dominant media, media strategy peddled by Western and corporate entities. Now, what tools can we use to deconstruct the narratives they give us? Okay, the first time I'll bring up is, um, although not as peculiar sounding as a MacGuffin, arguably, arguably a lot harder to come by. And um, it seems pretty straightforward um, to use this, uh, since we use this tool every day in our everyday lives. Um, but I do think it's important um, when we're looking at the situation in Syria, to not take it for granted. So, that concept is common sense. Okay, now I know it's hard to bluntly call for the use of common sense when it comes to politics, considering the most of, that most of the issues that we discuss are usually complex and riddled with nuances. They usually require some research and synthesis of evidence to make educated judgments. And when dealing with sensational headlines at face value, sometimes we don't have the tools necessary to look any further. But there is a very beautiful little spot in our minds reserved for fact and logic, and we shouldn't take that for granted. The more we train ourselves to frequently compare actual facts with what is presented to us, the more insight we will gain. So I'm actually going to start my discussion by looking at the recent um, US-led strikes on Syrian government targets in Damascus, and then we'll look back and cover um, other issues plagued by the same deceitful media coverage. Okay, so let's see, why did this coalition attack occur? For now, let's accept the official US narrative of punishing 
Bashar al-Assad for his alleged use of chemical weapons in Duma on the 7th of April, how can we apply common sense to question this unfolding of events? First, we draw on context by looking at the indisputable facts of the situation. We know, so number one, we know that the Syrian Arab army had liberated over 90% of Eastern Buda leading up to the 7th of April. And I'm sure that, so that's a fact well known on both sides, no matter what um, side of the conflict you're on. Number two, US President Donald Trump had recently announced his ambition to withdraw all US pres presence on the ground in Syria. So things were, you know, looking up, the illegal occupation in Syria was, um, you know, on the verge of disappearing. Donald Trump wanted to take out the um, US presence in Syria. Um, and number three, over the past two years, the Syrian government had made significant ground in the country, liberating many key strongholds, and from an objective stance, had won the territorial battle over the jihadist insurgency in Syria. Now, considering these facts, what strategic or military motive would, um, could we possibly attribute, attribute to a decision by the Syrian army such as the one that the USA would have us believe? What does common sense tell us? That Bashar al-Assad would gather his generals and advisors in a room and break it down to them, okay guys, we're going to use a chemical bomb on this one remaining suburb over which negotiations had already been taking place, from which most of the rebels had already fled, to spark international outrage and most likely instigate a direct military intervention from the international community and reverse all the gains that have been made in the past several years. I don't know about you, but common sense tells me there's something wrong with that narrative. I want, um, I'm going to show you now um, a recent BBC interview with a uh, former British Navy Admiral Lord West in which he questions some of these key points. I'll just play a bit of it. And I'll have to get over the desk. Oh, sorry. We can speak now to the Navy Pier of former Heads of Royal Navy Lord West. Is that volume okay? No. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah, would you like? He joins us from our Westminster studios, so and thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, you've been casting some doubt on what's been happening, the evidence, uh, according to uh, our own Defence Secretary, according to President Macron of France and others, about what happened in Douma, saying that the evidence doesn't really fit well for President Assad ordering a chemical attack. Just tell us more about your, your thoughts on that, first of all. Yes, uh, President Assad is uh, in the process of winning this civil war um, and he was about to take over and occupy Duma, all that area. He'd had a, a long, long, hard slog slowly capturing that whole area of the city and then just before he goes in and takes it all over, apparently he decides to have a chemical attack. It just doesn't ring true. It seems extraordinary because clearly he would know that there's likely to be a response from the, from the Allies um, what, what benefit is there for his military? Um, most of the uh, rebel fighters, um, this disparate group of Islamists uh, 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 have withdrawn. There are a few women and children left around. What, what benefit was there militarily in doing what he did? I find that extraordinary. Whereas we know that in the past some of the Islamic groups have used chemicals and of course there will be huge benefit in them um, labelling an attack as coming from Assad because they would guess quite rightly that there'd be a response from the US, as there was last time, and possibly from the UK and France. Is it um, fair to say, though, that you're looking at this from the point of from the point of view of strategy and tactics rather than any evidence? Uh, absolutely. Although we do know that the reports that came from there were from the White Helmets, who, let's face it, are not uh, are not neutrals. You know, they're very much on the side of the disparate groups who are fighting Assad, and also the World Health Organization doctors who were there, and again those doctors are embedded uh, in amongst the groups doing fantastic work, I know, but they're not, they're not neutral, and, and I'm just a little bit concerned because as we now move to the next phase in this war, if I were advising um, some of the Islamist groups, many of whom are worse than Daesh, I would say, look, we've got to wait until there's another attack by Assad's forces, uh, particularly if they have a helicopter overhead or something like that and they're dropping barrel bombs, and we must set off some chlorine because we'll get the next attack from the Allies. And there's no doubt that if we believe he's done a chemical attack, we should do that. Um, and those attacks will get bigger. And this is the only way they've got, actually, of stopping the inevitable victory of Assad. Oh, okay, I'll just stop it there um, for now. Um, 
Um, I think uh, Tim's going to touch on this after. No? No, okay, I'm not going to touch on this after, but um, this interview is not all well and good because afterwards he does um, use some qualifiers. He wanted, um, he tries to make himself, um, you know, fit into the Western media narrative. Like, despite all he said, he says he's still anti, uh, like, what does he say? Anti-Assad. Anti-Assad, like staunchly anti-Assad. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. But um, I'll just mention what the interviewer says shortly after. Um, so her name's Anita McVeigh, and she perhaps embodies wholly the attitude of mainstream media when it comes to crisis reporting. She tells him, given that we're in an information war with Russia on so many fronts, do you think perhaps it's inadvisable to be stating this so publicly? given your position and profile, isn't there a danger that you're muddying the waters? So here we have it, ladies and gentlemen. To question establishment propaganda is to muddy the waters in our information war with Russia, and we certainly don't want to do that. Um, so this is just evidence of how um, even people from Western countries questioning the um, narrative put out by the corporate media um, other they themselves questioned about it um, afterwards. So since the supposed chemical attack, um, sorry, go back to one. Okay. Since the supposed um, chemical attack, multiple on the ground reports have come out which indicate the people of Duma know nothing of the chemical weapons attack which infiltrated our headlines and heralded war cries from the West. These sources are real and they exist. Um, I also will be compiling um, a pile of sources and links regarding this massive fabrication for anyone who wants to see them afterwards. Um, you can just, you know, come talk to me. Um, but for now I want to show you this video of 11 year old Syrian boy Hassan Dia um, who was showed in the video that was used to um, you know, propagate this idea that there was a chemical weapons attack in Duma. Um, and he, um, this is his testimony, pretty much demonstrating that the attack was staged by the White Helmets. So, I'll just play this. Oh gosh. Okay. That's not gonna happen. Okay, maybe we'll just leave this later. Sorry, I did not know that was gonna happen. Okay. If you want to just have someone sign in, I can sign in for you. Should I have a sign in? Yeah, just sign it. Sorry. No, you just have to press next now. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really good. Sorry. Cool. Do you need your password already? <laughs> <laughs> says that um, what actually happened was he was outside um, with his family, with his mum, I think, um, and then he heard the calls for everyone to rush into the hospital, and obviously um, the hospital was seen like as a place of um, refuge, so obviously they all just um, rushed in there, and uh, as soon as he got in there, um, I don't know if he they says poured, this. They poured water on Yeah, so they started pouring water on his face. Uh, he didn't know what was happening. They just, you know, they just told him to stay in the hospital. So I pouring water on his face, they pouring water on other children. Um, they had no idea what was going on. Um, the White Helmets were, you know, screaming out, chemical attack, chemical attack. Um, so obviously they would know no better. Um, they were just accepting it. So that's pretty much what he testifies to in this video. Um, and, yeah, so I'll like, link it after. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay, so we can really learn a lot about um, Syria when we listen to the voice of actual Syrians. Um, so now we can ask why the false flag? What could it hope to achieve? So what could it, from a um, Western perspective, hope to achieve 
besides the obvious. All it takes is a small glance into history to see where blind acceptance of such allegations could mean the beginning of an uncontrollable surge of human suffering. Iraq. Take the Hussein government accused of carrying weapons of mass destruction by Western states at the UN Security Council, justifying an invasion in 2003 which has, killed, which has since killed over a million people. And only after the fact do we hear, sorry, we made a mistake. The international community cannot blindly accept this anymore. Uh, I'll show you a small clip of the Bolivian ambassador to the UN Security Council. I believe that we must absolutely remember these pictures and that this, in, in this very hall, we were told that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and this was the motivation for an invasion. And that invasion, after this invasion, there was one million deaths. And it launched a series of atrocities in that region. Could we talk of, about ISIS if that invasion had not taken place? Okay, so that was at the um, that was at one of the recent um, UN Security Council meetings about Syria. So basically, he just brought up the picture of um, what was it, a test tube being presented to the anthrax. The yeah, uh, being presented to the UN Security Council to justify the invasion of Iraq, which only afterwards we found out was a complete fraud. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, or uh, another example, sorry, when we examine Libya. So the destructive Western push for a regime change and the operation to oust Gaddafi from power led to the complete dissolution of the only form of stable authority in the country, leaving violent jihadist militias and thugs to inherit Libya, an ensured state of perpetual chaos. It was in this post-intervention Libya that we saw the emergence of the black slave trade, orchestrated by dominant Islamist factions. This is literally happening as we speak, so just let that sink in. What more information could we possibly want? It's nothing but folly to attempt to legitimise any of the military opposition to the Syrian government. And key focus on military. It has become a well-known fact that any moderate rebels, if there were some at the onset of March 2011, were very rapidly infiltrated by Al-Qaeda-linked factions, or at least on their own, constituted radical Salafi ideologies, which have no place, no place, in discussing the future for Syria, for a secular, pluralistic Syria. If you support the overthrow of the Syrian government, you accept the taking over of Syria by these extremist organisations as the consequent alternative. And if, someone does not hap and if someone does happen to refute this claim and argue the existence of a moderate and secular opposition group which has a legitimate means to take over the country, I only suggest that you ask them to specifically name one of these groups and sit back, relax and enjoy the wait. <laughs> and it's not just the history of states which have been destroyed by false media narratives, we must also look into Syria's own history, into the history of this war, to see just how cyclical the nature of this fraudulent framing of key events is. So when navigating propaganda storms, this cyclical pattern is perhaps the easiest thing to spot, which should arouse suspicion. So last year, um, in my talk, I covered the liberation of Aleppo, which occurred in late 2016, where government forces and their allies defeated al-Qaeda-affiliated groups who besieged the town in 2012. This event was defined by a propaganda storm alleging that the town had been sieged by the government, starved out, and consequently massacred in the, Syria's, in the Syrian army's attempts to recapture it. These stories were, of course, completely detached from the reality on the ground. It only takes an inquiry into what we saw when this storm died down to see the truth. Photo evidence, then and now, of a glorious and celebratory Aleppo population. A member of the, a member of the, Syrian, um, of the Syrian army carrying an elderly, elderly lady on his back as evacuations of eastern Aleppo were made. Christians celebrating Easter for the first time in five years. This was not a mere territorial grab or a recapture. This was a liberation from a long and brutal jihadist siege. And so this year we saw the same narrative play out in a different Syrian region. In March we saw a sudden uproar in the media at the Ghouta genocide, happening as the Syrian army operation to liberate Eastern Ghouta was underway. This fight was a fight to liberate the people under siege in regions under control of the largest militant faction in East Ghouta, Jesh al-Islam a Salafi Islamist group which have previously called for the ethnic cleansing of minorities from Damascus and have carried out public executions and beheading. beheadings. 
one of the same groups that have bombarded Damascus suburbs with mortars, mortars and missiles for the past six and a half years. The only thing that could have saved Jesh al-Islam from defeat was outside intervention. And so we saw the media campaign begin. Um, and like the, um, the Navy Admiral mentioned, um, we do have to question also where the sources are coming from. And it's a known fact that the majority of sources um, that the Western media draw from uh, come from the White Helmets, which have been framed as this neutral um, first response team that um, you know just responds to the atrocities committed by the Assad government. They, um, they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. I think, was that, yeah, they were nominated for a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. Oscar as well. Oscar, yeah, yeah, they had a documentary on Netflix. So they were, they were really glorified in the Western media. And here's a picture of them celebrating with Al-Qaeda. And this is one of many, many, many um, pieces of evidence that we have that they are linked to these um, Al-Qaeda groups. So yeah, it's really important to question where our sources are coming from, first of all. Um, and it's not that the corporate media is clever or cunning in its fact, in fact, sorry, it's not that the corporate media is clever or cunning. In fact, it's almost humorous how sloppy some politicians and media corporations are in conveying their narratives surrounding Syria. The problem truly does lie in people taking what the US and Western countries have to say about the conflict at face value. It is our duty to question. It is our duty to notice patterns. It is our duty to follow up on these deceitfully covered events after the stories have left our screens. You'd be surprised at what you found, find. Some of you may remember Barna Alabed. So this is an innocent child um, who, and she became a figure who emerged on social media during the battle and liberation of Aleppo. Her Twitter account set up to document the siege of Aleppo, which we now know was a complete fraud, um, goes to show the extent the opposition will go to, that is, exploiting the persona of a young child to call for more war. Um, as you can see, one of her tweets from her um, Twitter account up there calling for the World, World War III. Um, yeah, so that was in 2016. And then, um, and then we saw the picture of young Amran on this side here um, as accusations of a genocide in Aleppo were being made. So I asked, where are they now? Amran and Bana, two kids from Eastern Aleppo which were abused, both abused by Western media. Yet there is a key difference between them and their respective fates. Amran's father turned out to be a pro-Syrian government, uh, turned out to be pro-Syrian government, and exposed the lies of the Western media in an interview he did. Barna's father, as I've shown a picture there, is a well-known anti-government terrorist and lives the lie which is concealed by the media. Naturally, we never saw Amran again, and naturally, Barna literally went to the Oscars. So that just goes to show. The extent that um, the Western media, yeah, the extent that to the Western media, the Western media goes to um, to pro propagate its narrative in Syria, um, and now she's just become a figurehead of um, the anti-government side. So now that we have briefly looked at the kinds of destructive lies we're dealing with in Syria, we must ask ourselves how can we contribute to a solution, and more importantly, why should we contribute to a solution? Now, I think the main thing to point out first is there is no external solution to the problem of bias and manipulation in mainstream media. As long as our governments have a grand design governing their geopolitical behaviours, which of course they need to promote, there will always be this tower of treachery from which all popular media outlets broadcast the news we receive. And I can take a wild guess and say that this will be happening for a long, long time. The only solution can be, and is, internal. It is a conscious decision each one of us makes to either sit on the sidelines and let injustice and dishonesty prevail, or to champion the effort for truth and fair journalistic treatment of global affairs, exposing our knowledge and letting our governments know that we know. We know what they are doing. And we, the Australian people, do not and will not approve. And if not for the sake of a suffering Syrian population, or a suffering Palestinian population, or a suffering Yemen Palestinian, population, or a suffering Venezuelan population, for the sake of our own country. The information, on war, the information war in Syria does not just affect Syrians, it's an inherent threat to our democracy itself, and some may consider this a stretch, but I seriously want you to think about it. In theory, our dem democratic government wants us to make decision, decisions, and to vote on those decisions. 
Well, what agency can we say we have when we allow our governments to control the basis and information off of which we make those decisions? So um, I want to show you a quote from a guide for critical thinking I came across. It's um, by Dr. Richard Paul and Dr. Linda Elder, which emphasizes the importance of having critical minds. So democracy can be an effective form of government only to the extent that the public is well informed about national and international events and can think independently and critically about those events. If the vast majority of citizens do not recognize bias in their nation's news, if they cannot detect ideology, slant and spin, if they cannot recognize propaganda when exposed to it, they cannot reasonably determine what media messages have to be supplemented, counterbalanced or thrown out entirely. So obviously, questioning is a major tool, because usually when things don't add up, there is a good reason for it. The hardest part in combating a deceitful establishment narrative is contemplating the reasons why such an effort would be made against the truth. I often ask myself these questions, how could so many people contribute to this propaganda? And who am I to go against what's on the news? What benefit do corporate corporations gain from peddling false narratives? Okay, now... Okay, so we've seen time and time again, plastered on news reports, articles, documentaries, academic discourse, this simple statement in many forms. So it doesn't seem as straightforward when we're looking at it, but I just want you to think about what does this represent? Um, I just pose a question, does 2 plus 2 equal 5? Unless I'm mistaken. Usually it doesn't, I don't think. I mean, maybe. No. No, yeah, oh, right. No. 2 plus 2 does not equal 5. No. In fact, we know... I hope we know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Yeah. So if we take the first um, statement to represent the lies and the false information we are given, and we take the second statement to um, reflect the actual truth of the situation, whatever that situation may be, um, I want to ask, when it comes to geopolitics on the other side of the world, for us, truly, what is the difference between 4 and 5? We can admit that when the stakes involve us directly, the difference is crucial. So say you're doing a maths test, and I work under the assumption that you care about the grade you're getting, the difference between a right answer and a wrong answer is important to you. That's probably why, and I hope a lot of people can relate, um, that when you're doing a maths problem in the exam, and you're breaking down the equation, and you, have to, you, get to, um, you end up having to do something like 2 plus 2, and you know the answer is 4, but you put it into the calculator just in case. Just in case that this one time, 2 plus 2 might just equal something else. Imagine we had that same eagerness for accuracy when it comes to current affairs. The eagerness to check. Think about it. How important are facts to you when your stakes in them are not as high or as personal? Why should we care when the media gives us an answer of 5? What are the ramifications of such an error on us? This is the exact moment when we must draw on that tool which is so often forcefully removed from a discussion of facts. That tool which can so easily be used against us and against others when we are misinformed. That tool which is but whispered when discussing geopolitics, and that is our own sense of empathy. The only way we can work toward a solution is to reconcile facts with our emotions about the state of the world, to give the facts meaning, and to realise what they mean for us and the world around us. This our capacity for empathy, along with the search for real truth, is the heart of poli political activism, no matter what issue is at hand. This is when we can realise that the difference between four and five is the difference between a war being resolved and a war getting bloodier. It is the difference between fair legal process and the violation of an international law that creates precedent for other disastrous violations. It is the difference between eradicating head-chopping terrorists from a country or making them the primary sources for our knowledge on that country's affairs. It is the difference between increased, crippling economic sanctions on a struggling people, or a step forward in aiding the return to normal functioning institutions. It is the difference between a child being able to return to school for good, or having to live another day deprived of education under Islam's rule. This is why the truth is important. Now there is no um, use in denying the innate power of the corporate media. It's there. It, turns, it frequently turns facts into fiction, heroes into villains, and can create outrageous and sentimental events from the very dust on Syrian ground. This very notion is obviously unacceptable, and we must never stop challenging, debating, and fiercely exposing the facts and the reality of what's happening in Syria. 
1906, in a concluding chapter of his classic book, Folkways, William Graham Summer um, raised the possibility of the development of critical societies. So um, he writes this quote, the crit critical habit of thought, he says, if usual in a society, will pervade all its mores because it is a way of taking up the problems of life. People educated in it cannot be stampeded, are slow to believe. They can hold things as possible or probable in all degrees without certainty and without pain. They can wait for evidence and weigh evidence, uninfluenced by the emphasis or confidence with which assertions are made on one side or the other. These are the people that we should strive to be, and these are the people that Syria deserves us to be. So, thank you.